Today we are going to talk about KAs and I have come to Dash Built Precision Fabrication. Notice how I read it on the door. That's a nice, nice door. I like that. Very professional looking. Um, yeah, so we're here today to talk about KATs. I came to the person I know the most about. I came to where a person is that knows about the best. Anyways, Spencer knows a lot about KAs. So he has a really nice shop. The shop is AC'd. It's insulated, it's beautiful. He has lots of cool cars, like this turbo Porsche, or whatever this thing is. It says 6.4 liters, and it looks like it's twin turbo Dodge Chrysler, with fancy, oh, lots of fancy parts. He has his fancy, super fancy KAS14 that's been driving in our series off and on for like over a decade and he's gonna tell us all about this thing and we're gonna look at it. And he does amazing fabrication, which is his specialty. I, I assume that's amazing fabrication on that. I don't know a lot about fabrication. There's a cool dry sump in three outside. You need to stop by and see oh, okay. on your way out. Is this dry sump? No. Why not? It doesn't need it. Because KAs don't have oiling issues. They only have cheap owner issues. There you go. Poor little guys. Okay, let's get started. Hello YouTube, I am Aaron Losey of Lone Star Drift Channel and I have the opportunity to talk to Spencer. Um, he, tell us about your shop real quick. Dashville Precision Fabrication. We are at Dashville, this is my, uh, my shop. We do a lot of race car um, fabrication um, and just race car preparation. We also work on street cars as well, but we have a focus in roll cage fabrication um, and exhaust, uh, turbo kit stuff, um, yeah. If I was to put it in a few words, he builds super, super nice, like high quality stuff. Not your typical drift stuff, like super high end, almost hot rod quality stuff. Yeah, and to clear that up, we actually don't work on dr uh, <laughs> drift cars. Uh, okay. The only one that stays in the shop is mine. And uh, There's one outside too. Oh, don't. Don't, okay. Drift, drift people don't come here. Okay, second thing. We are going to talk today about KAs. So the reason why we're here is he has been running a KA in Lone Star Drift on and on, or on and off for probably about... 10, Ten years? Ten wow. Years. So he is super well versed in these things. We're going to chat about them. Let's get started. So I'm going to start this video off real quickly and then I'm just going to hand it all over to him. So the first minute or so of me talking is going to be about the history of KAs. Now, the reason why we talk about this is because there was always a big debate over SR versus KA. And the timing of that debate is very important. A lot of people just think like, oh, KA is better, SR is better. You know, they're going to talk about something like that. But realistically, you have to know what year all that was in. So if you're gonna talk about KAs in 2003 or 2004, it's completely different than that. All right, I'm taking too long to talk about this. Basically, in 2000 to 2004 to five, all KAs were just basically stock KAs. Maybe they had an aftermarket exhaust, but they were about 165 horsepower at the crank. They were not super fast cars. They were not great drift cars, unless you have very small tires on them. And they were just kind of, you know, to go around and be as cheap as possible. The cars were very cheap. You could pick up a 240SX for $1,000 back then. And that means the SR guys had immediately 30 to 40% more power if they swapped in an SR, and the SRs were basically better drift cars, I would say. Yeah, Do you agree? Sure. Okay, so at that and time much, period- Much quickly attainable. Yeah, and they were more reliable, they were nicer, and all that stuff. And the big reason that was is because you had the haves and the have-nots. The have-nots that didn't have any budget they immediately went KA and the haves went SR, which was a self-fulfilling like self prophecy where the SR guys always had better luck for the most part and always had nicer cars with more power and cooler stuff, and the KA guys didn't. So you advance a couple years in time and suddenly you now have turbo manifolds for super, super cheap, you know, $100 SS Autochrome and super cheap turbo parts and stuff Again, the better guys went full race and nice parts over here kind of thing with SRs, maybe Tomai or Tomei. They kept having nice stuff and the KA guys kept getting worse and worse almost because as they turboed the cars, they only made them less reliable and junkier. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, fast forward a few more years in the future and the KAs are kind of all the junk stuff. They have a really bad reputation at this point. It's not until you start getting some really nice turbo manifolds out there that people will then invest in good turbos and good standalone ECUs and all this stuff. So not until maybe the 2008 to 2012 time period, 
you start getting good ECUs which can control stuff because before that everyone was either using a super AFC or some type of fuel pressure regulator to take care of tuning. Um, they weren't really doing anything about timing. You know, like it was kind of a disaster. So all those cars were basically going to blow up unless they were very basic T25 builds. Um, and then now you advance past 2012 to nine and now it's a level playing field. Now all the SRs are really old and they have to be rebuilt. So you can't just go buy a great SR and it runs. All the KAs are really old and they have to be built. So you're starting off at level playing fields with really good aftermarket industries with great parts. And now it's only down to the person building the car to make it good. So he's gonna now tell us, that's your quick history lesson of where we've gone to. And now you can talk to somebody that went through that whole time period. I'm gonna ask him some questions and he's gonna do all the talking. Go Spencer. <laughs> oh, what do you wanna talk about first? Uh, no, that, that's, that's fine. The history okay. into um, basically my history of, of owning a KA um, up to this point. So that would have been um, kind of started the same way that uh, he mentioned about um, when I got into 240s and was looking to turbo the KA, you could buy a full uh, SR pull-out swap kit, everything, ECU, harness, trans, for 15 1800 bucks. Um, I don't know why I didn't do it, but I just didn't do it. Maybe I, I was just a <laughs> cheap, cheap kid. You know, 17 years old is when I did the first one. So I actually did. I um, bought a bunch of... And the first turbo kit I assembled for a K took me like a year to find the parts because I was doing it so cheaply. I bought a um, stock SRT25 for 100 bucks, bought SR injectors because they're the same injectors, um, you know, a Walro 255, and uh, I don't even remember the manifold. It had to have been some eBay manifold. Um, and it was actually tuned on an SAFC with no timing control. So like Aaron mentioned, you, there was no timing control. We didn't really have the Gretty E-Manage or the uh, Power uh, FC. All we had was SAFCs um, or maybe really early on you could do some standalones, but no one had any experience in that. Um, so that was the first setup and I ran a couple of those for a while and actually didn't, uh, didn't blow one up. Um, you know, it was probably only making like a little over 200 horsepower. I, I don't know, you know, like seven, eight pounds of boost. Um, not a great power curve because the T25 is pretty small for that car. Um, and then, so the next stage up would have been like around 350 horsepower. I actually ran a single cam uh, KA in this S14. That was something I always wanted to do. Um, I'm just rambling now. That's okay. Keep going. Um, I can also toss in questions if you want. Yeah, just whatever you want to do. <laughs> so. I ran a single cam K in this car, which is something I always wanted to do. Um, up to that power level, the single cam and dual cam were pretty similar, though the single cam had even less parts aftermarket. So I did actually build the turbo manifold and built a lot of parts for that car. Um, but I ran, um, I ran that car at about 350 horsepower for a while, um, and then kind of took the next step into um, building a what I would call a you know fully forged, fully blueprinted engine with um, with nicer components, just because I had a lot more faith in the at the plat in the platform at this point from what I had learned. The first crazy KAs that everyone wanted to talk about when you got into dr like drifting and pull up and like, hey, this is how great KAs are, are the naturally aspirated 300 horsepower like IMSA type KAs yep. that were all single cam. Those were all built by race shops that you know were factory backed and stuff, unlimited money. Those engines did not last long. How long did those last? It's like a maybe a 15 hour uh, yeah. service inter interval for a full for a full overhaul. Right. So that's a KA that makes 300 horsepower naturally aspirated, and that's and they what... also cost upwards of 15,000 for just the long. Ah, haul. Yeah, that's crazy. You can still find. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Still find... And they ran those in 350Zs yep. and all kinds of weird cars and stuff. That sounds because weird, but they were in 350Zs. CCA limited the uh, displacement for that class at 2.4. Mm -hmm. And that's why the KA was very a very strong uh, and still is a good option for that class. Yeah. Um, so those were 300 horsepower, but they weren't usable for drifting because they were so expensive that you could literally have an LS7 for that money. So they're cost prohibitive and they don't make any sense for that. Two, they 
did not last long. If you're gonna have an engine that only lasts 15 hours, that's only gonna last for you know a couple drift weekends. That's not acceptable. Meaning the naturally aspirated KA stuff that was up to that point was not acceptable. And then there was no turbo stuff up to then, correct? Not at all. Um, so you basically had to figure it all out as you went and wait for the aftermarket to catch up with you. So that each time you wanted to go to the next stage, say you originally had the T25 set up and 200 and something horsepower, when you wanted to go to that next stage, you had to wait for people to make those parts, make the ECUs, make the injectors, make right. all those parts so you could drop them into your car, or you'd literally have to be a fabrication shop like this to make everything work. Yeah, which right. is not cost effective if no. you're not a fabricator. <laughs> it's Even if you're a fabricator, your time is money, especially right. within the shop, and if you're fabrication time is you know over a hundred dollars right. an hour it's still gonna cost you a massive amount of money to put together your yep. own car very okay. expensive um, so now this KA stuff makes sense um, did we go into why did you pick it specifically no okay the region the reason I originally went with the KA was probably uh, for cost and the fact that I was you know 17 and a kid and it was already in the car and it was probably easier to convince my mom that I'm gonna turbo this car instead of pull the engine out in the, in the gravel driveway and you know do all that. So that's probably why that actually, uh, why, why I initially went with the case. So from a race car perspective, that's not a great reason to Absolutely do Absolutely not. Right, so there's no great reason for the original KA build on this. So basically he ended up with this and then he just stuck with it over the years and now it makes sense, but back then it right. didn't necessarily it did not make, make sense. sense back then. So what are the strengths of the KA platform? To me, you don't have rocker arms and you have more displacement and the cars came with it from the factory and those are the biggest reasons. Absolutely. Um, what are the reasons you... So when I decided to uh, uh, choose the KA based on a more logical understanding of this engine and this platform and all this, about seven years ago, six, seven years ago, whenever this engine um, got built the way it is and I committed to this level of build, um, I had a couple engine options, right? You, you I basically had... a I had an SR, LS, KA, or um, Jay-Z. Jay -Z. Th those were my engine options. Um, and I weighed all of them pretty heavily, and I knew a lot about the KA at the time. And I had actually learned a whole lot about the KA as well. Um, but again, it is the fact that it's a, a four-cylinder iron block aluminum head, which is basics, but it, it can handle boost. Um, the you know the, the engine it's a cradle design for the main caps which is a, a pretty good um, a pretty strong option for for an engine like this um, the oiling system is very good the uh, the displacement for this size engine for a four cylinder uh, made made it uh, kind of the step for me in between an SR and like a a, a two J or a one J you know um, for the displacement. Um, and so I just learned a lot more about it and for me um, I was never obsessed with a KA and I still don't think it's the best engine I'm not one of those guys that's like <laughs> you know the KA or life and like screw SR because you know this is way better it's none of that for me it's like down to Excel sheets pretty much like cost for what I'm gonna do uh, weight numbers come into play, uh, dyno graphs, all of these things I was comparing um, when I originally did this this latest build about six, seven years ago. I would lay over dyno graphs. I would compare cost. I worked at Chevy, so I actually had discounted uh, LS parts. We had deals with LKQ. We had all kinds of stuff where I almost made that decision. And uh, ultimately, it came to me, uh, the decision was going to be KA or LS. And um, mainly that was because I would I chose the KA over the SR because of the displacement um, and the fact that it doesn't have rocker arms and um, the iron block and, you know, just a couple sm small reasons. But And I didn't choose a Jay-Z because of, uh, mainly because of weight and because of the cost because um, I believe the Jay-Z is probably the most expensive platform out of those to build to the level that I wanted because any of these engines were gonna get torn down. Uh, I wasn't gonna put a used um, junkyard motor in here. So it became the LS versus the KA and it, I, just, I just sat down and did a numbers game um, and the LS was still going to be more expensive to do than this original uh, you know, 450, 500 horsepower uh, KA 
and I liked the idea that I already knew about the setup. Um, it, I knew that it didn't have oiling issues like the LS did, and I knew that. Um, You want me to jump in and keep you going? Well, yeah. All right. So after all that talking, it comes down to the fact that you're the normal KA guy still that you did it because of cost. Almost Pretty. everything related to KA stuff, which is really interesting. This isn't like bad mouthing KA guys. It's just talking about the mentality of KA owners over the years. Typically, most decisions in the KA world come down to cost. Yep. Which at, is, least, at least it was that way before any of the knowledge or parts uh, that are available for them today. Right, and obviously this is not a cheap setup that he has in his car. Did you go look at the spreadsheets? Yeah. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Don't let me forget. All right, so we covered the strengths. What are the weaknesses? Try and keep it to like 30 seconds. Okay. What uh, are the weaknesses? Weaknesses for, for the KA, I would say um, it is not a very balanced engine and you can feel that just by the way that the car revs and runs. Um, I believe an LS is uh, a lot smoother of an engine than a KA. Um, the long stroke can be a can kind of be a downside because that's their first. Um, that's kind of the weakness of the car with the with the long stroke. Um, as far as more weaknesses, I do think running the coolant jacket through the cylinder head next to the number one cylinder could be considered a weakness because you're going to run a higher intake temps on that cylinder. Um, that's that's about all I have there though. Okay, so literally no weaknesses. <laughs> all right, because um, most of those are pretty simple. Yeah. I would think the biggest weaknesses of those cars, or I mean of this engine platform is, they're mostly really old at this point. You literally can't go buy a really cheap $50, $100 KA like you used to be able to, which is why you a lot of people did. say the same for all though. I mean, that's, everything no, no, no. is going up in cost. You're correct, but originally the KA was if free. You, if you were gonna tell me you can have a Jay-Z for $1,000, a KA for $1,000, you know, an LS for $1,000, so you know, like as your starting right. point, would you pick the KA at that point? Absolutely not. Okay, so no. nowadays you're locked into the platform because you have it and stuff. It doesn't make as much sense for a new person to get into it is what we're saying. Uh, I, do, I do believe so. Okay. okay. I'm, I was gonna say also like there's a lot of Honda motors that you can now put in that would be very interesting, like a K24. So the, that day and age, if you were to tell me that the cost was going to be all the same for the KA, LS, JZ, SR, I would have obviously not picked the KA. <laughs> um, however, this day and age, with the knowledge that is known about how to make these cars run um, at this level and the parts aftermarket for these cars, I believe it's a very strong contender for that for that platform between an SR and a 2J. Yeah. Um, and you know, maybe the guy that doesn't want to do an LS because unfortunately that makes sense most of the time is to do a, a simple LS swap. Yeah. Okay, next, let's push on. Single cam versus dual cam. So, because you did have a turbo single yeah, cam. This car was. Uh, the single, original racing motors were all single cam. Yep, they were all single cam. The most development in the K was for the single cam. And they have all kinds of incredible engineering parts like uh, full carbon air boxes, dry sump systems, uh, custom oil pans that Nissan did for these cars. But um, we don't have access that, to any of that, no, so it's all you, off the table. It doesn't I, matter, there's any stuff. Yeah. You absolutely cannot <laughs> find any of those parts, so don't even bother looking. Yeah. Um, okay, so single cam versus uh, dual cam. Generally, the dual cam will make more power because of the cylinder head design um, and its ability to uh, degree the cams individually over the single cam. The blocks are basically the same. The rotating assembly is basically the same. The single cam comes from the factory with a slightly lower compression ratio. It has no piston oil squirters, which you know, you could contribute to detonation if you're gonna run some large uh, turbo application. Uh, dual cam does have piston roll squirters. The uh, aftermarket is still not totally there for single cam. It still uses a rocker style uh, valve train. Dual cam does not. Uh, there are some people that make a solid lifter conversion for the single cam, but in stock form, especially this day and age, there is quite a bit of advantages with going with the dual cam. So single cam has rocker arms? Yeah. So can we just ax that right off the top since it has <laughs> okay, rocker but arms? They're, but, <laughs> but it's not like an SR, they're more fixed and... Okay, so you're not gonna throw rocker arms no. in a single cam? I, at least I don't okay, have any experience. Okay, next either. question. 
We kind of covered the IMSA stuff already. All the IMSA racing stuff with all the cool single cam KA stuff is off the table. It literally doesn't matter. It doesn't exists exist. because you'll never see it in your lifetime. Yeah, I'm, I literally Easy have enough. never seen these parts. Um, okay. And, yeah. Go ahead. I've been yeah, around. Never seen them. <laughs> yeah, for this okay. long. So now, back in the day, in the early days of KA, and we're going to ask this question, but I already know the answer naturally aspirated or turbo? That was originally a really big question. There was guys that did ITB builds, they did all kinds of stuff with KAs, and I don't think, in my personal opinion, the naturally aspirated KA makes any sense nowadays. What do you think? Absolutely not. Okay. Um, I get how it's kind of appealing for guys that come in that say, you know, either they, they want to be different or, you know, whatever that that's worth, or they want they think that maybe they can do it a little bit cheaper than having a turbo car. You know, say they've got money for intake and exhaust now, or it's a brand new kid that's coming in that just got this car, and he thinks, well, I'm just going to buy the NA parts because I don't want to turbo the car later, and I think I'll make good power with it um, NA. Well, turns out that's actually far more expensive if you're going to uh, pursue that um, realistically. I think the largest horsepower NA build from a... Uh, from a normal person, not a factory race team, was around 220 horsepower. And yeah, I mean, yeah. we're talking probably... So if you're going to do naturally aspirated, keep it basically bone stock, yeah. maybe an intake maybe and exhaust intake and header, little things. exhaust, tune. drive it, you know, yeah. drive the car, it'll run forever like that. Doesn't mean you can't have fun with it or anything, just means don't go for don't, some big naturally aspirated um, build. Talk to people like me or people that have experience in that and just see that it's not worth, uh, it's just not worth your time. So turbo all the way. Yeah, or or put an SR in it or put something else in it. You're the KA guy, you can't say SR. Okay. That's literally like KA versus SR, you can't do that. You can't change sides in the middle of your conversation. Okay. You're the KA guy. Anyways, we're gonna go through no modifications down the chain of extreme basically, and you're just gonna tell us about each build. So what does it take to make like a 200 to 250 wheel KA? Okay. We'll start with the horsepower uh, stages basically down the line. Your stage zero or stage one will be something you can probably run with a stock clutch for a minute. Um, that's just going to be a T25 from an SR, uh, SR injectors, which are direct drop in. You don't need a fuel pressure regulator because the stock one is a one to one. Um, you're going to run probably an eBay, excuse me, like an ISIS turbo manifold, ISR, because they have come to the market now and they're kind of like, and that cheaper range. And you're gonna run probably, what I would do is buy an eBay intercooler core. Uh, you can still, like a CX Racing, and still get those very cheap. And either piece together a piping kit, if, you're, if you have the means to do that, or buy the ISR piping kit, because it's kind of the only cheap option on the market. Um, the turbo will be internally gated, so you just need to have a blow off valve. I wouldn't run a, uh, eBay blow off out, I would do something like maybe a, a used gritty or a used tile, something that you can maybe get for like 150 bucks. Um, the stock distributor is going to is gonna work fine, all that's going to work just fine. Um, you will have to, you can run an SR downpipe, but the, the actual elbow from an SR will have to be cut and clocked. Um, but I've actually had that done by some muffler shops before if you don't have any options to do that. Um, that's basically, uh, you know, of course you got your oil lines, um, but that's basically the uh, stage, you know, zero, stage one. Um, stock motor, stock cams, everything like that. Uh, and that, th this day and age, you would just use like a, a Martin with a RS Enthalpy, would tune your ECU, and you can actually look around and find those ECUs uh, used all the time and um, have Martin flash it if it's different for you or anything like that. Uh, he offers discounted rates if the ECU has already been shipped and you just need to have it changed. So uh, the ECU tune is going to be important and that's going to transfer through most of these stages. That sums up stage one. Stage two would be like maybe three to 350. You still don't really need forged internals. You're going to need a bigger turbo, so you might run like a legitimate 2871. Um, you're going to need bigger injectors, I believe Subaru's has a side feed injector that will fit in that's like a five, 550 or something like that. Your Walbro will still work. Um, and most of that stuff should transfer over. Um, the next stage would be like a forged, uh, forged engine, anywhere like around 400 horsepower. 
I'd even say like above 350 horsepower. Um, you, you're going to need to forge it, so you're going to need to do uh, rods, pistons, um, head studs, main studs, a decent head gasket. You can still run stock cams, but I would recommend uh, doing the valve train when you're in there. BC offers the springs, retainers, and uh, buy some camshafts from them. The 264s are uh, usually what I, I run. You don't really need to worry about degreeing the cams at this point. You also don't really need to worry about the ignition system at this point either. The distributor and the plug wire system should still hold um, upwards of 20 pounds of boost on the stock ignition system. So if your injectors will, um, you can find you can find some 770s sometimes to fit on the stock rail uh, because going to a top feed rail is quite a bit more cost. There's only a couple people that offer a, a nice one and that would be Radium. Radium is really the only one that's well engineered at this point. There's a couple other companies that are doing it but they're not, uh, they don't have the options that this, uh, this one does and you have the cost of going to a top feed injector and all that. So if you can stay with a stock rail, stock fuel pressure regulator and side feeds, um, you know, maybe you can find some 770s. I ran those at one point. Um, some companies like Dishworks and uh, other injector companies will sell those. Um, you're going to run a forged, a forged engine. Um, the Walbro 255 on pump gas will still kind of get you to this point. You're going to be really pushing around the 400 horsepower range on pump gas. Um, most of the guys will go to E85 basically above a 400 horsepower. Um, but again, you're going to have an ECU tune uh, from Martin at, at Enthalpy um, if you're not prepared to go to a standalone. You don't need to do that. The ECU tunes are uh, very good these days and um, that will basically get you uh, to, that, to that point. Um, and are we going to go all the way to this? Yeah, go to this. Okay. So real quickly, I just want to interject and say, because it's hard to say for yourself, this has got to be the best running, best large power turbo KA in Texas. It is immaculately built. I never see it fail at events. It has been going for a lot of years. I don't know how many iterations he's been through, but he's been driving at Lone Star Drift events for literally 10 years. It sounds amazing. The engine does not sound like a normal KAT. Um, it puts down a lot of power. This car is as fast as the five and 600 wheel um, Jay-Z's and LS's and anything else. Um, it does not lack in the horsepower or torque department at all. Like this is an extremely legit motor. Um, so he's going to tell you about it real quickly. Right before you kick off, how much does it cost to replicate this without labor? Okay. Long block itself from valve cover to oil pan. This includes the ATI balancer, which is a, a kind of a, another high dollar option. Um, without the ignition system from valve cover to oil pan, it's right at $5,000 with no, uh, at parts at retail and with no labor to assemble the engine. That does include machine work though. That's $5,000 from valve cover to oil pan with no labor for assembly. Okay, then if we're going to add in the, this whole uh, driveline system here minus transmission. So we'll say everything in the engine bay here plus the electronics and fuel system uh, the, since this car runs on E85, it's probably going to be, um, oh gosh. Keep going. I uh, don't actually have the updated spreadsheet here, but it's probably going to be uh, closer to 15. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, probably f f 15 will get you... 1,500? Oh, God, no. <laughs> 15,000. 15,000. 15, between, okay. between 10 and 15,000 dollars for what I say would be a... 600 wheel horsepower KA on a standalone uh, map sensor conversion E85 with a um, really nice filter filtration system um, with a e, uh, E85 flex sensor, um, the uh, Honda coil pack conversion, uh, big big boy throttle body, uh, nice tubular uh, stainless manifold. Um, basically, this is this. Do you is, think you could do it for as cheaply as 15? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think you could do it for, for 15. Um, no, and what manifold is this? I actually make these. Um, this is a, manifold's beautiful. This is a um, design I did. It's uh, made from 321. Um, these are, so while we're touching on manifolds, for anyone that's looking for a high quality manifold like this, um, I believe that the only quality option for, and I might get a lot of 
<laughs> flack for this, but I believe the only quality option for turbo manifolds for someone that is looking to purchase one and be able to trust it through the abuse uh, of anything similar to what we are doing in any sort of track or race application is the full race manifold. Now full race, it is not only about the uh, welding and construction that they do, but the design of how the, of how their wastegate is built is actually a superior design than any, uh, any other uh, manufacturer. And I know that because I'm a fabricator and I build these things daily. Um, I build my own manifolds because it's cost effective to me. And I reached out to full race and they didn't want to help me out. So, um, <laughs> I'd love to run one of their manifolds, but I build my own um, for myself and friends, and um, and I have to build them from 321 stainless uh, because they just do not hold up to the abuse uh, that we put them through, yeah. and they and they have cracked. Um, and what turbo is this? This is a new, this is a new Borg Warner um, SXE version, which. I have this thing about turbos where I don't want to invest in a very nice like GTX or EFR, even though that's everyone's dream. I have this thing where I can't invest in a very high dollar turbo because I'm afraid that I'm going to lose it. It's going <laughs> to it's going to die, and that's two to twenty five hundred dollars that I'm just not prepared to spend. So um, Borg Warner came out with this uh, SXE version, which is their old Airworks design, but and of course it is journal bearing so it's not going to be as nice as a ball bearing however it's uh there are no water lines so it's only oil um cooled and mm -hmm. lubricated it has a billet wheel um a nicer compressor housing they have more uh, exhaust compressor housing options and it has a 300 degree uh sorry a 360 degree uh thrust bearing for the uh cartridge which is a, a large upgrade for these turbos what is this little guy right here this is, is that a restrictor it is actually a filter and I swear by these things, um, ever since I have started using these turbo pre-filters, uh -huh. I have not had a turbo failure. Huh. So anytime anything goes wrong with the engine or there's any debris into the uh, turbo, I've found that the turbo is uh, basically the first thing to die because uh, I'm guessing its guts are too small and it can't, yeah. it can't absorb uh, or pass through that kind of debris. So a uh, forced performance makes these and they make them in different restrictor sizes so they're actually built in. And I honestly checked the filter in that thing. It's just a stainless reusable pull yeah. apart deal. I check the filter in that maybe like once every six months if, if you know. Okay, and what is the uh, millimeters in the turbo for the size? Oh, uh, this is what they call a, a 257 or something. So I don't know the exact. There's no millimeter. Millimeter. Yeah. I have looked at compressor maps. It is a little bit larger than a 3076. Okay. Um, First of all, all the fabrication on everything is beautiful. Everything's painted to match. The whole car is so incredibly clean. Powder coated. Um, oh, powder coated. <laughs> powder he's, coated. he's correcting me. Um, you said this was Honda Ignition? Yeah, so these are Honda uh, K-Series and F-Series coil packs with okay. just a basic uh, bracket that I built to hold them in there. Nothing real fancy. Yeah. Um, and then there's a company that just makes this small uh, cap here for the distributor. So the distributor still acts as a cam angle sensor. Mm -hmm. And if you have a standalone, it's very easy for your uh, tuner to go in there and use the stock distributor as the uh, cam angle sensor and fire um, Honda or, you know, whatever other coil packs you're going to use. Okay. So this is obviously you wired all this, right? Yeah. Okay. This was done. And it goes to the, like, the whole wiring harness is obviously handmade right okay uh which is not necessary this was done by actually my tuner um seth francis he's an instructor for efi university um but it's we do not use the words mil spec because some people get very offended <laughs> i i call it a motorsports um and inspired harness or motorsports style harness it is not mil spec but it has a lot of mil spec um you know components over here on the firewall, we have a, a single mil spec disconnect. Um, that is, you can you can do this a couple different ways. You can just twist lock it off and put it put, uh, set that harness on top of the engine and, and remove the engine, mm -hmm. or you can take the sensors off uh, individually of the engine. Um, or the way he actually did it is it's a uh, it's adaptable where I can disconnect the coil plug harness if I'm going to leave the valve cover assembled, and I can disconnect the injector harness as well. Um, and the way he did, you know, he just did an excellent job on all that. I haven't had an issue with this harness. Cool. Um, this is that fancy radium fuel rail you were telling us yeah. about. Um, what other cool things are there on here? 
Um, I usually will, these cars don't have a terrible breather system from the factory, but what I will do is I'll kind of Looks design, like the front. kind of design my own. This is the stock uh, spot here that I welded a bung on and th that one there was basically for some testing if we need it. But what I do is I block off the stock PCB systems on the engine, uh, take the valve cover, flip it over, drill out all the rivets, take the baffling system out, drill and weld, uh, new bungs, um, under the baffling system, re-rivet the baffle back in so you can get all the debris out, and then basically that allows you to run it to a catch can. Um, and uh, I don't run a drain back system, I used to. Now I just run a, a nice Peterson uh, catch can here. It doesn't really have to be something like this, but this is the one I've had the most luck with. Mm -hmm. And it just runs your standard two of two dash tens off the valve cover. Um, and was that necessary to do all that? I did. I did have some issues uh, when I was road racing the car uh, with with blow by. Uh, I never had those kind of issues with drifting because I think that the engine has time to drain that oil in between runs. And like a thirty minute road race session, you don't have that option, and it would it would fill up the catch cans. Okay. And with this setup, even road racing, do you have to empty the catch can constantly? I, I do have to empty the catch can, but it's something that's a well within uh, you know normal yeah. race day stuff it's it's not a big deal at all and why don't you plumb the catch can back into the system so the engine gets it somehow so to deal with it so you don't have to externally drain it so i have i have done that before um a couple of reasons why i don't do that anymore is because i believe that somehow it was still getting debris into the engine mm -hmm. uh, my oil was constantly dirtier whenever i had the catch can plumb back in even though it was sealed and had filters and all this uh it just seemed to be a dirtier option. Also, and you know, for the people that are gonna say, oh, well, you're letting the water back in your engine, there's water in your oil all the time, okay? That's that's normal. As soon as you start the engine and it comes up to operating temperature, it burns off the water in your oil and that's that. So I don't wanna hear anything about that. But um, also, it was hard to control the way that it drained back because the lower line would pressurize and sometimes it would actually come up and if there was any oil sitting on the catch can, it would actually blow it upwards. So I tried a couple things like a, a check valve, uh, sorry, a one-way valve and a couple other options, but ultimately we got away from doing that. Um, I don't run a drain back system anymore and I don't recommend it on this engine. Okay, what other cool things? Like you obviously have really nice clamps, you have so nice, we'll nice touch hoses. On, we'll touch on the intake. Okay. Uh, we use the stock intake manifold mainly because there are no options that have been proven to make the same uh, power curve that this one does, like especially in the torque and the low mm -hmm. end range. The one thing I did do, because I never found a KA throttle body that wouldn't leak past the shaft whenever you're doing boost leak testing, is I actually made a, I have CNC designed and made a, um, throttle body adapter for the stock manifold mm -hmm. to run this really, really, really nice K-tuned billet throttle body that's a, uh, they call it a, a five, Mustang 5.0 bolt pattern. So a lot of the uh, Honda guys and a lot of guys that are building their own manifolds will run this throttle body. Mm -hmm. And basically it is- um, And this is the throttle body you're talking about yes, on here right now. Yep. And oh, it he is called designed, me sir. It is designed <laughs> to hold uh, upwards of 60 pounds of boost and doesn't leak. and uh it goes basically right on um and so really nice piece from k-tuned um so some people have mentioned the q45 throttle bodies i actually never ran one um i just tried multiple uh, ka throttle bodies of different generations and even single cam throttle bodies and they would always leak past the shaft so i didn't want to deal with that anymore um and and ever since i've gone to this we haven't had any issues okay keep showing me cool things um this uh, this car runs a like coolant surge tank system, which is pretty standard on most race cars. Um, however, the KA does not come with this from the factory, and a lot of Japanese cars don't. You'll see this. This is a like more of a European. Most OEM European cars will come with this. It's just a coolant surge tank system. So what it will do is it will take from a couple spots on the engine, and you may see this in LS is very common, but it just takes a high port mm -hmm. from a couple different spots into the top of the surge tank. And then there's actually a line on the bottom of the surge tank that feeds it back into the uh, back into pointing, the sorry. back into the lower radiator hose right here. And so it, it allows it to feed back in. This is something that seems very trick, and people 
question it all the time. It's just a standard uh, coolant surge tank that European companies have been doing forever. So how do you bleed it? it? Uh, you don't. You just pour the water in here, it? and it's all self bleeding. Oh wow! This cap down here uh -huh. is only here. This is a block off cap. It doesn't actually have any. There's no spring or anything in there. Uh, I just use the block off cap so we can keep the radiator uh, not modified if I have to, have to buy another one. Okay, that makes sense. So this is the only radiator cap and literally all you do is you just fill it up mm -hmm. and run it and uh, everything self bleeds. Wow. So for the people that are having a, a tough time with the OEM radiator, even on the SR stuff, uh, a basic surge tank like this and people are selling them. I think um, Powered by Max or Chase Bays or any of those guys are selling these. Um, and Something you like run this. an electric fan. Were you yeah. finding a problem with the mechanical fan on those? I was not finding a problem. I basically have gone to the mechanical, I'm sorry, the electrical fan uh, years ago. And really it's just for packaging reasons now because the that's actually a fan off a Corvette. It's a single 14. You know, the radiator is, uh, it's all different stuff now. It's the only reason I've, I've done that. Okay. Um, you know, if you're running a stock front end with a stock, uh, replacement radiator which could be like a Koyo or uh, Mitsumoto or any of that the stock fan and fan shroud actually work really really well and that's been proven time and time again okay so uh, the car has fuel pressure regulator back here that's fairly normal um, you know blow off valve it runs an intake air temp for the um, standalone one of my favorite parts about this uh, ECU and electronics is the fact that it's a map sensor car and not a mass airflow. Mm -hmm. If you've ever owned a mass airflow car, especially a turbo car, um, you probably hate them just as much as I do. I used to carry probably four or five spare mass airflows in the trailer <laughs> um, because they would always uh, they would yeah. always fail. And what is the ECU on this? This is a uh, very early on Haltech. This is a Sprint 500, which can be had for. Uh, very little money for maybe five, six hundred bucks. Okay. This is a Sprint 500, which will only run a four cylinder, but it uh, controls all my, um, you know, uh, direct uh, coil unplug ignition, normal high impedance injectors, um, but it will not do anything like eight injectors or um, it doesn't have many inputs outputs. So yeah. for a race car, it's fine, but if you're trying to control things like separate fuel pumps on a switch or fans to be controlled by the computer, this is not the uh, ECU for you. You may need to go to their more uh, new, uh, like uh, Platinum Sport 1000, 2000, all that Elite Series. And you were telling me that you data log this car. Are you data logging it off of the dash or are you da yeah, data so, logging it off the ECU? So from my experience in the road race community, um, I had been using the AIM, AIM Sports uh, logging dash um, just on lots of customers' cars. And what that'll do is if you have a CAN bus system like any standalone ECU, which is another reason people are moving more towards standalone ECUs. We'll get into that. <clears throat> if you have any standalone ECU or any factory ECU that's new enough to transmit over CAN bus, uh, AIM has this deal where they, uh, they offer a dash, they offer two different versions, and they are expensive. Um, but when you factor in how many gauges you're gonna do and the labor to wire in each gauge individually, especially if you're gonna pay a shop to do it, it's in, it's outrageous, it's insane. Um, so it starts to make more sense, especially if the install is just two CAN bus wires. So AIM offers a system, and a couple companies are doing this, but we like the AIM one the most because it's the best uh, user-friendly, the software is the best, and they have a really strong, um, a really strong software for road racing and uh, just general data logging of the car, uh, G's monitoring, um, uh, all kinds of track data that you can pull up and analyze. So <clears throat> this one uses an MXL2, and we'll get into that, um, where it is, uh, the install on this was four wires. It was power ground and your can high and can low system. So it makes a lot of sense, especially this day and age, if you have a, st a standalone or an ECU that can transmit over CAN bus. Um, so it just makes a lot of sense. So what we do is we data log uh, this car. It's the logger dash. So of course it does all of your G's, your accelerometers. Um, it will log anything that the ECU sees. So it'll do boost pressure, water temp. Uh, I mean, anything you can imagine, uh, it, it watches and um, can log all of that and transmit it over a graph and do all this stuff. And um, 
Yeah, what's really nice about it as well is you can program in conditioned alarms, which is incredible. Uh, basically what you can do is, I, I have, I don't know, probably a dozen alarms set in here, but you can say, okay, and especially on a turbo car, well, things, things are so variant, and at boost pressure, you may have a lean warning, or you may, you know, things are always gonna be bouncing around. <clears throat> and if you just have a simple warning light, you're not gonna be able to, to configure this thing. So the way that the AM system will do it is you have conditioned alarms where you can set several conditions where, okay, say the car is above 400 RPM, which means it's on, and the boost pressure is under, uh, you know, X amount of boost, the AFR should be here. You know, you have another condition where if the boost pressure is between here and here, it needs to be a little richer, which would be between here and here. And then you have, if the boost pressure is above here, the AFR should be here. And then you can set how long is it going to uh, recognize that before throwing an alarm. And then basically what it'll do is it has multi-color um, configurable lights and it will actually come up on the dash and, and tell you exactly what is going on. So you know, okay, cool, well, this is just a you know warning or yeah. um, like for instance, the water temp comes up to uh, like a low warning and then basically it'll tell you it's at like 220 or you know something like that. So you know that um, it's, not, it's not critical yet. So you can set just as many alarms as you want and then they have an option for the oil pressure one is where as well where it can be conditioned as well. So, you know, RPM over this and oil pressure under this, you can set that to come on. Well, if anyone's ever had an oil pressure warning indicator, usually they go off at idle, right? Because yeah. it's the oil pressure is too low. So again, this does all condition stuff. And um, I don't know, it's one of, one of my favorite parts of the car and it was definitely a hard pill to swallow. But when you, when you take away five, six gauges in the car yeah. and uh, the ease of installation, I was using the oil pressure setup by RPM and everything else to fire my AccuSump on my LS car with a factory ECU to make it simple for right. that, so which there's, is kind of cool. Right, so of course, the, the, the dash even has inputs, outputs to where you can do things like that, uh, which is really incredible. Um, for a factory ECU, um, like my wideband doesn't transmit. There's no two sensors, to, one for the dash and one for the ECU. There's only one for the ECU. There's only one O2 sensor on this car that goes to the ECU and all of that information goes to the dash. So that's, to me, that's really incredible. Anyone that has gauges, well, you have your factory water temp gauge and then you have to put one in for your autometer or your AM or whatever. This thing literally uses the factory water temp gauge and it transmits into the hall tech and then to the dash. I mean, it's, yeah. so basically the only sensors that are added to this engine are ones that it did not come with, which would have been like oil pressure, uh, oil temp, um, you know, all the other stuff. So we talked about stock, basically engine with a turbo on it, all the way to the extreme setup. We talked about how much you caught, like it cost to do extreme, about 15 grand to use quality parts. Um, it would go up from there, and that's obviously without labor or anything if you're having a shop do it. So that's things to keep in mind. Um, ECU tuning over the years, we talked about you had Martin from e RS Enthalpy and NizTune and companies like that doing a stock ROM tune which is a chip that goes on the stock ECU. You open up the stock ECU, they burn a chip off of a little tiny chip burner by like tuning your car for what they think it's going to be, popping on a ROM chip, dynoing the car or whatever, seeing what's wrong with it with AFR and stuff, guessing the timing, I would guess. Yeah, yeah and a lot of times they're just guess. mail order, you don't even have, you know. <laughs> That's probably not a good idea with too much power and stuff. Right. You're currently running E85, I assume? Yes. Um, how much fuel pump do you have? Like one Walbro 45? Uh, I do have a one Walbro, the, the large, I guess the four, um, or 480 or whatever it is. Okay. So he does have a four, or a Walbro so the pump, pump. The pump, one. yeah, just a single pump with just dash six lines to make that clear. Um, the the uh, fuel system on the uh, stages of the build would be, I don't really drive this car or recommend driving them like above the 400 range on pump gas. I actually would would start to run race fuel or mix race fuel in uh, for the events that I would turn the boost up and that's how I, I did it. I don't really recommend running uh, you know over 400 horsepower on pump gas just because you're gonna have to take all the timing out and I just hadn't done that. So your options are to convert over to E85 or to if it's just a you know race day type deal um, 
run race fuel in it, but but the 85 has been the more. And just one of those pumps has held you. How much horsepower are you running uh, at the wheels? And do you have a dyno sheet to send me to overlay right uh, here? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, it's hard to get accurate RPM spots on the dyno because this doesn't have any. Um, oh, that's okay. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. Uh, it's done as high as like 600 foot pounds and like 550 horsepower. It typically dynos around like 540 wow. horsepower, 540 torque. On one pump? Yeah. Wow. That's really impressive. Yeah. I would think that's maxing out that pump. No? I don't know. No. I actually do not monitor fuel pressure, but we monitor <laughs> but we monitor AFRs on... Everything's good. Yeah, I haven't seen anything. Okay. Um, real quickly, how many motors have you gone through and why Okay. on these? Three total, one single cam and two dual cams, uh, engine failures. The single cam, and I'll make it known that they were all, um, at least not the engine's fault. The single cam failure was because I was running one of those plastic uh, intake uh, gaskets that are supposed to be a thermal spacer or whatever. Don't run them, they don't work. I have proof and pictures and evidence that they that it melted um, at relatively normal coolant temperatures, like sub 230, sub 240 for sure. Uh, and so basically this gasket failed and allowed water from the water jacket into cylinder one. And I was at a competition and just kept driving the car and, and uh, basically uh, popped the ring lands on cylinder one. That was one engine, uh, which that engine is actually still around and that's probably, uh, that's the single cam and that's um, a really nice build that we did for a, for a buddy that uh, he still has the car and he's driving it. I have two dual cam engine failures. One was because the wrong size, I assembled the engine with the wrong size rod bearings in it. Um, so it, it actually ended up rod knocking and uh, it was a big cluster, but you know, that was ultimately my responsibility. And, um, and so that engine rod knocked. We were able to just replace the crank. I don't grind the cranks. We just, we try to have them where they're only polished. So I got a new crank, put that one back together and put it in. The last one would be and this is important, um, for anyone who thinks that they're going to run a different oil pan, specifically the excessive oil pan, um, even with a very high quality lower SR pan, um, I uh, actually rod knocked an engine running that exact same setup where the uh, stock KA oiling system and oil pan was nowhere close to oil starving. Um, Basically, I went and did a track day with that oiling system thinking that uh, I was going to have the more capacity and there was going to be better oiling for when this car gets faster and faster on the road course. And the first day I went out, it, uh, it was showing signs of oil starvation and the second time I took it out, uh, it, it rod knocked. So I don't recommend running any oil pan other than the factory KA pan. And um, yeah, just don't buy into all the hype. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of parts that... Uh, are kind of marketed towards one thing and will cost you a lot of headache. So the stock K oiling system, we have data that shows, I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of sessions on track, track days where this 100% stock K oil system will withstand like up to 1.7 G and like 1.45 uh, steady um, several times around a track and basically it's done that probably a thousand times and um, I don't have any data that shows any oil starvation with that. All we do is we uh, just overfill it one quart so it runs five quarts for the whole system. Was that all your motor failures? You just That's it. Them all? That's okay. it. Three. Next question. What do you rev it to? Only seven. Okay. Um, and the, the main reason for that is because the way the package is put together with the turbo and the cam uh, cams that I use and the way the cams are degreed, I really only rev it to seven because uh, that's where you know the curve kind of kind of starts okay. going the other way. But you're not going to rev this thing to nine thousand like no, SR. No, 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 absolutely not. Okay, they'll do they'll do seventy seven. You know, if your cams are different and you really want, you just need to move that power elsewhere. Yeah. Very last question. Do you know what it's going to be? Mm -mm. Okay. The question is, knowing everything you do about this KA, living it for years, if I was to take away this car, say it got stolen. Or just say the motor oh, got question. completely stolen. Really good question. And you had no more KA parts in the in the shop, but you wanted to replicate a 500 horsepower Basically, car. Similar car. What would you build? 
That is an excellent You could do question. an EcoBoost V8. You could right. do a, I mean, like any stupid engine. It could be electric And this motor, is going to be, this is going to be super SRK. lame. SRK. What? This is going to be super lame. Yeah, like V8. No. Honda even. K24 motor. Right. There's a lot. Four people are putting 4Gs in these. 4G63s. Uh, no. Yeah, it's let's gonna, not do that. It's going to sound super <laughs> lame, but to me, this car is my dream car and yeah. it does everything I could ever ask it to do. I drive it on the street every now and then. It's a very competitive pro-am level, you know, close to pro two level drift car and it uh, runs at the road course all day. So I really can't ask for a better car. Mm -hmm. And then that being said, the engine, I just go back to this engine works for me. What I ask it to do, you know, it's lighter than your RB or 2J. It's to me, it uh, makes you know it makes more power uh, per per boost pressure and and all that of an SR and um, I just I just think I would stay here. Um, the fact that this 1988 development engine yeah. has better oiling system than a 20 current you know 26 when they stop making the LS. They still make them, the LTs and stuff. Well, yeah, they're different. The Are they a better oil? The fact system? that the KA has a better oiling system, and I can prove that um, time and time again, um, is just is impressive. And so you're gonna stick with this? I'm gonna stick with. You're it. not gonna go with we, anything different. We actually will not build an LS road race car without a dry sump system because not even Aki sump. Aki sump's okay, but it's more of a band aid. Band -aid. Yeah. Um, if a car if a car is gonna consistently starve oil, you need a dry sump. So with all that, I know you it sounds terrible, but I wouldn't. Now I might not do this car as seriously, and I know Aaron loves hearing this. I might go back to stage like 1.5 <laughs> because that was one of the most fun stages this car was ever at. Yeah, 270 horsepower will do all of TMS road course on a 255 17-inch tire. Uh, that was one of the most fun stages this car was ever at. Uh, running on pump gas, you can run on a tuned ECU. Um, and I mean, just beat the car until it can't. I didn't tell him to say this, by the he way. He did not tell me to say <laughs> this, but you know, this car is obviously too far gone, but, um, if anyone's going to do it, I recommend you at least go through that stage first so you can experience it. Even knowing that all the KAs are kind of rough and like old now, and you're going to have to refresh the whole motor and stuff, I mean, you still go that route? It depends on, do you want a V8 or do you want a, a turbo car? Okay. You need to make that decision first because an LS makes the most sense in most circumstances. For me, I don't really like it. I can make more power at less money than an LS, and it has a better oiling system. That's why I haven't done it. That's it. Um, you need to decide if you if you like an SR, you like a KA. SRs are fine, um, but basically at this point in time, they are uh, they're the same age, and you're going to probably have to crack open both. And the reason the another reason is that the SR price has climbed so high. I mean, a KA has as well, but you can still get KAs for three, you know, three hundred bucks. Um, I think I would still still do it. Yeah, I might crack okay. it open and and uh, you know kind of go through it, but I still might do me like a little three hundred horsepower KA. Awesome. Well, I'm glad he's sticking to his roots. Yeah, he's not changing, and he's and, not and getting a better sounding engine like a L, like a Jay Z. Jay -Z. He's not giving in to to all the other better engines out there. <laughs> he's sticking with his, you know. His handicap of a KA, yeah. he likes he likes being hobbled. Yeah. No, I'm joking. Okay. Thanks so much, Spencer. Awesome. That was easy. That was like I felt like two I cuts. Was rambling. <laughs> no. Boom! Thank you to every sponsor that worked with Lone Star Drift this year, including BC Racing Coilovers, NRG, Coyo Rad, GK Tech, Siki Manufacturing, Spec Clutch, Inky Wheels, Kenda Tires, Garrett Turbo, ECU Master, What Monsters Do, AEM, and everyone else that helped out, including all the drivers, judges, spectators, volunteers, everyone. Thank you. Bam.